गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन सो लेट एस स्टार्ट विद टूडे सेशन सो आई एम डॉक्टर सौरभ दीक्षित एंड आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू वन अकेडमी बट बिफोर आई स्टार्ट द लेक्चर लेट मी टेल यू अबाउट द अनलॉक ट्वेंटी ऑफर विच इज गोइंग ऑन सो यू कैन जस्ट डू वन थिंग दैट यूज द कोड डॉक्टर दीक्षित एंड गेट सम एक्स्ट्रा डिस्काउंट सो एंड दिस ऑफर इज गोइंग टू एंड टू मोरो सो प्लीज मेक यूज इन केस यू आर प्लानिंग टू बाय वी हैव वन मोर इंटीग्रेटेड बैच विच इज स्टार्टिंग वेरी सून so do make use of that also now let us start with the today's topic and today's topic is a very interesting one so we are going to discuss something on <coughs> the concept of gi bleeds so when we talk about gi bleed gastro intestinal bleeds <coughs> what do we mean by gi bleed this is very 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 important what is gi bleed bleeding anywhere from the gi tract so gi bleed can be of two types it can be upper gi bleed it can be lower gi bleed so what is the differentiating factor between a lower gi bleed and upper gi bleed answer is where they are located and for that good evening aman good evening so what for that what is the most important thing students the most important thing for them is this ligament of treats so try to understand this ligament of treats ligament of treats is very important thing so any bleeding distal so if the source of the bleeding if the source of the bleeding is distal to ligament of treats then that is what is known as lower gi bleed and if the source of the bleeding is proximal to the ligament of treats so if the source of the gi bleed is proximal to ligament of treats then that is what is known as upper gi so this is how we define upper gi versus lower gi the next very important thing is let us talk about the various terms which are used good evening pia good evening so various terms which are used in this case so let us try to understand them they are very 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 simple so miscellaneous terms that we are using so the first is what is hematemesis what is hematemesis so when you talk about hematemesis it is nothing but emesis of blood and emesis of blood is classically defined as what students this is upper gi bleed so this is upper gi bleed and this is very 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 simple thing the next that we talk about very good very good the next that we talk about is students the concept of melina very tell me quickly what is melina students what is melina answer we have a very simple straight forward description of melina it is nothing but black the word that we use is black tari so black tari foul smelling stools so black tari foul smelling stools this is what is known as melina bachche altered blood is not exactly it is a black tarry foul smelling stool now when we talk about melina why this happens so try to understand the blood and the blood has hemoglobin so the hemoglobin hemoglobin when it interacts with the acid in the gi tract so the acid of the basically of the stomach oxidizes oxidizes the hematin so hemoglobin has a very important component as iron you know as hematin into acid hematin and this acid hematin is basically what in color students this is reddish brown or you can say coffee brown or blackish in color and this is what is the concept of melina so try to understand very good very good try to understand this melina is a is mostly associated where you will find this acid this is mostly associated with upper gi bleed so why it happens because acid will interact with the blood and this oxidation will require a lot of time and this time is given by the long journey of the blood traveling in the small intestine large intestine and along with this it gets oxidized because of the interaction with the acid now tend try to understand when we talk about lower gi bleeds 
lower GI bleeds, they never they never present with what actually they don't present with melina except in few cases. So lower GI bleeds rarely can present with melina. And when they can present with melina, try to understand when can they present. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Good evening, Monisha. Good evening. When they can present, let me tell you. In case of an association with what? slow GI transit. What do you mean by slow GI transit? Suppose if a patient is having constipation. Yeah. Suppose if the patient is having constipation. Now the colonic bacteria, you know, there is one more, there is one more place. Look, we are colonic cancer will always present to you with what? The classical hematochesia. Hematochesia means blood with the stool. But in case of rare cases where you have a GI bleed, suppose a colon cancer is there. And along with that patient is having a slow GI transit, constipation. What will happen? The colonic bacteria, the colonic bacteria will get a lot of time to interact with what students? With the blood. And therefore, therefore, it does the same thing. First of all, this is not as powerful as acid. Therefore, not every patient will present. It is only in case of slow GI transit that rarely even lower GI bleeds can present to you with melina. So I hope that is clear. Then the next challenge, the biggest challenge that we get to see is, if you are talking about melina, sir, then how will you differentiate melina versus black stools of iron supplementation? Are you getting? So black stools and which is typically seen in iron supplementation. So how do you manage this iron supplementation related black stools versus melina? Answer is merely if a patient comes to you and says, Doctor, I have black stools. Don't, don't be worried about anything. Why? Let me tell you. The black stools per se, they can be because of simple iron. The first thing that you should be asking is the consistency. The consistency is the first clinical hint. And what is that? It is well formed well formed solid stools what about the consult what about the consistency of melina it is tarry what is tarry like molten coal tar yes very good and then we are going to go for goaic test what do you mean by goaic test actually you are going to go for the per oxidase per oxidase test goaic test or a per oxidase test so you are going to try to find Goaic test will be positive only for melina. Why it will be positive for melina? Because it is having blood. But it is not positive for what? Black stools. Why? Because it is an iron supplementation stool. Are you getting? Yeah, you can say there will be. Of course, patient might be asymptomatic even in case of an upper GI, lower GI case also. So melina versus black stool. This is how you differentiate. I understand because today my hospital is on the main road. And there is some local mar marketplace which comes up every Tuesday. So I understand there could be some uh, noisy things. And I started the class so it's not uh, possible for me now to shift the venue. That is why you are having some problem. I apologize for that. Let us try to understand more important things. So when we are talking about the further terms, we can talk about hematochasia. What is the concept of hematochasia? Hematochasia. What is hematochasia? Hematochasia is nothing. Hematochasia is nothing. Blood, blood mixed with stool. Blood mixed with stool. Now, what is blood mixed with stool? Better known as this is known as hematochasia. Now, is it upper GI bleed or is it lower GI bleed? Answer is this is associated with this is associated with lower GI bleed. Why it is associated with lower GI bleed? Because of the rapid transit. So if you have any source of colonic bleed, the colonic blood will rapidly exit out of the colon and the colonic bacteria will not get lot of time. So I want to ask you, can upper GI bleed present to you with, can upper GI bleed present to you with hematochasia? Tell me, tell me. So can upper GI bleed present to you with hematochasia? Yeah. Answer is yes, it can present to me with hematochasia in case, in case of rapid GI transit like we had 
can melina be seen in lower ji bleed yes in case of slow ji transit the answer is in case very good everyone very good so in case of rapid gi transit like in case of diarrhea even the fresh blood from peptic ulcer disease can come up massive you can say yeah in case of massive also but yes this is the scenario now tell me if you talk about hemorrhoids have you heard of hemorrhoids in hemorrhoid students we have the blood coming after defecation so i would say that this is gi bleed which is not associated with stool so what is the terminology for that so what is the term for fresh bleeding pr so fresh bleeding per rectum fresh bleeding per rectum what is the term for that can you tell me what is the concept for fresh bleeding per rectum tell me fresh bleeding per rectum what is the term just a minute So actually, I have asked my assistant to make an alternate arrangement in another room. So I will pause the video for after two minutes, for one minute, and then I'll shift to another room where there will be less noise. Even I, it's irritating me a lot. So what is the word for fresh bleeding? Yes, answer is rectorrhagia. Rectorrhagia. So remember this term. What is rectorrhagia, students? It is fresh bleeding per rectum. unrelated to unrelated to stools so remember fisher in anno will be associated with hematochezia you see that classical streaks of blood on the stool but hemorrhoid is associated with rectorrhagia so colonic cancers might be associated with rectorrhagia are you getting the next term is we have something which is known as occult blood occult gi bleed versus obscure gi bleed occult gi bleed versus obscure gi bleed can you tell me the concept of occult versus obscure gi bleed what is the classical pattern bachche let us see let us see bleeding so i would say episode of bleeding episode of bleeding where will you say ki it is present and where will you say it is absent can you tell me the difference between occult and obscure occult and obscure tell me occult versus obscure this is very 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 important occult what do you mean by occult hidden but a hidden source of bleed so episode of gi bleed is not present here no episode of gi bleed in obscure gi bleed the episode of gi bleeding is present then bachche when you will do endoscopy when you do endoscopy what are the conventional endoscopy upper gi or lower gi endoscopy yes it is positive yes it is positive so like a patient of malignancy suppose you have a patient of cancer the patient is pale patient is having tachycardia all those features of blood loss but when you ask patient is there any episode of gi bleed patient will deny but again on the other side if you have a patient who is having active bleeding like in case of meckel's diverticulum like in case of small bowel carcinoid so all the small intestinal pathologies can never be detected on upper gi or lower gi bleed so these bleedings are yes considered to be obscure so here the upper gi endoscopy shall be negative just just give me one minute pause the video for one minute i'll shift to another room and from there we'll continue with this theek hai so there is lot of noise here that is why hello students hello students am i back
Is audio video clear? Actually, I just changed the room. I have just gone to another room. So I hope there is no disturbance now, no noise. Yeah, no noise. We can start. Just let I take one second. Since this class was a long, this is a long class, so I did not want myself to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Audio clear? Audio is clear to everyone. Can I have a yes from the crowd? Yeah, I will change. Is it okay now? Is it okay? Okay, okay. Chalo, chalo, chalo. Okay. So, bache, obs now is it clear? Obscure. We have seen obscure versus occult. The next thing that we shall be talking about is, let me change the template. Pull up this template over. The next thing is, let us talk about approach to upper GI bleed. Approach to upper GI versus lower GI. So whenever we have a patient of upper GI bleed, let us talk about the approach. The approach. And then in depth, we will talk about the treatment, treatment, etc. everything. So whenever we talk about the upper GI bleed, the next is, we need to the first line the first line of management is secure abc now what do you mean by secure a b and c because the patient is having upper gi bleed now there's a fairly increased risk of what aspiration and thus it is very important to secure this airway airway breathing and circulation so airway, breathing and circulation are the three things which should be taken care of. Otherwise, the patient will have aspiration, pneumonitis. Along with that, once you have done this, the next thing is start IV PPIs. Now, what is the significance of this IV PPIs? Can you tell me what is the significance? I hope the background is clear now and uh, noise is also clear. So I, it was disturbing me a lot also, but anyways, I started the class. That is why. So but when we talk about IV PPI, what is PPI? Proton pump inhibitors. Why do we do this PPI therapy? The answer is we start with PPIs because we presume that the most common cause of upper GI bleed is what students is peptic ulcer disease and IV PPIs. The importance is it is not going to prevent the bleeding now. It is not going to stop the bleeding, but see, it is to it is to prevent episode of rebleed. So it prevents rebleed. So the bleeding has to be tackled, but it will prevent the episode of rebleed. That is what is very important. Now, when you talk about securing the circulation, how do we secure the circulation? There are two things that we need to understand. We need to understand the concept of cannula, and we need to understand the concept of fluid. So fluid loss as well as the cannula. When we talk about, yeah, diodinal ulcer, exactly the bleeding is more frequent with diodinal ulcer than gastric ulcer. I will tell the reason also. I will tell the reason. Just wait for a few minutes. Now when we talk about the fluid and the cannula, this is a classical case of hypovolemic shock which happens. So when we talk about the fluid, the first line fluid, the first line fluid that we have to start is the crystalloid and remember we have a lot of crystalloids you can go for 0.9 percent NaCl along with that or you can also go for what students ringer lactate along with that you can go for plasma light also along with this you might require the blood transfusion also so plus minus blood transfusion of this depends upon the degree of responsiveness of the patient now when you talk about the cannula now this depends whether the patient has gone into the acute stage of hypovolemic shock. The first thing, very good Pia, very good. The first thing is we have the 14G, we have 16G, we have 17G. So this is what is your orange, this is what is your grey and this is what is your what students, white. These three IV axes, they are classically used for rapid resuscitation. So rapid resuscitation, we classically use these three cannulas. 
then we have the classic one as 18G and this is the green. This is the green which is standard for all surgeries and resuscitation. All surgeries and resuscitation we prefer to go for green but rapid resuscitation or for trauma we have. I will tell, I will tell. Sir, do IV PPIs? Yes, Pia. We want to prevent the episode of recurrence and how can we reduce? Because since we believe that most common episode is due to the acid, it will reduce the acid and thus stop or halt the ongoing, you can say. So this is a damage control procedure, not a damage correction. Then if you have, unfortunately, if you have it for the kids or someone else, so pink 22G is your what? Uh, blue 24G is your what students? Yellow and 26G is your what students? Violet. So this is for pediatric age group. So pediatric age group we use this and pink is for all infusions. All infusions we are using this. I am not going into this trauma chapter. So I am not going into anything else. Now once you start with the IV PPIs, when we start with the IV PPIs, what is the next line of management that we have? The next line of management for IV PPIs is uh, so next line is Riles tube insertion, Riles tube decompression. But see why we want Riles tube decompression to reduce the what load? To reduce the acid load. The second is to reduce the risk of aspiration. Are you getting this? So reflux is reduced by this. Not only this, along with this, also the Riles tube decompression has an advantage of what students? Important is bedside assessment. How can we do bedside assessment? Let us see this. Let us see this. So bedside assessment can be done. But see, remember, once you do a Riles tube decompression, the next thing is the moment patient is hemodynamically stable, the moment go for what? Upper GI endoscopy. So when we go for upper GI endoscopy, the patient has to be hemodynamically stable. Now students try to understand we prefer to go for early upper GI endoscopy. So early means within 24 hours. So recommendation, recommendation nowadays is early upper GI endoscopy. What do you mean by early upper GI endoscopy? Within how many hours students? 24 hours. So this is helpful. Why it is helpful? Not only it is diagnostic, it is also therapeutic and it is also prognostic in nature. Now one student is saying, Sir, I understand this thing and we, we shall discuss this. Tell me how do you do a bedside clinical assessment with a Riles tube. Let us see that. So whenever we talk about bedside assessment, bedside assessment is done with what? Riles tube aspirate. So when you talk about Riles tube aspirate assessment, so whenever you have a Riles tube, you will aspirate out something and then you will check what is there in the aspirate. Imagine if the Riles tube aspirate is blood. If the Riles tube aspirate is blood, it will confirm upper GI bleed. Are you getting? Yeah, we, but see if it is a therapeutic, if it is a life saving intervention, you will have to see, nah? you will have to, there is no other option. The second is, if the Riles tube aspirate is by it rules out, it rules out upper GI bleed. Why? Because bile is secreted from the second part of the duodenum. And after second part of the duodenum, it is rare to see a cause of upper GI bleed. Generally, after second part, you will have second, third and fourth and then ligament of treats will arrive, uh, 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 will be present. So definitely, if there is blood around the duodenum, whenever you aspirate, it will come. So if clean bile is coming out, it virtually rules out the cause of upper GI bleed. The next is, the next is, if there is bile plus blood. So if there is bile plus blood, now this is a case where you require endoscopic confirmation. So endoscopic confirmation is what is required in this case. So but generally, whenever you have a patient of upper GI bleed, this is how you are going to evaluate the patient. Now, the next very important thing that we are going to say is important scores, important scores associated with upper GI bleed. Can you name some scores? 
Tell me kids, can you name some scores for me? Upper GI breed related scores. They are very easy. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent Samba. The first that we talk about is bleed. Bleed. But say bleed is a score for a criteria. It's a score for criteria for hospital admission and not only hospital admission also for prognostic assessment. So it's a criteria for hospital admission and for prognostic assessment. Are you getting? So what do you mean by bleed? Bleed itself stands as a mnemonic where excellent, excellent Glasgow's and Blatchford. So bleed stands for episode of blood loss. Then E stands for whenever there is something, some problem associated with GI bleed there will be elevated INR. So more than 1.2 times is what is considered significant. The next is, tell me something just a minute. Okay. The next is, whenever there is GI bleed, the patient will be in hypovolemic shock. The next very important thing is, so erratic mental status. Erratic mental status. Then what do you mean by, achha, what achha, forgot to tell about L. L, what does L means? Low systolic BP. What do you mean by low systolic BP? Less than 100 mm Hg. So less than 100 mm Hg. What else? What else? This D stands for comorbid diseases. So comorbid disease. And this is what is very, very, very important. So comorbid disease, we have blood loss, low systolic BP, elevated INR, erratic mental status. This is all defining the bleed. Remember in, a lay, remember in a layman's language, a score of more than 3, if 3 or more the parameters are positive, it is considered to be what? Significant. And if it is significant, this is a criteria for hospital admission. Because there are a lot of scores, but not all of them are actually used. So, we have one more score. What is that? We have, we have Blatchford, Blatchford. And we have a score which is known as Rockle score. So Blatchford score and we have Rockle score. Blatchford score and Rockle score. Yes, there are others also, but they are the one which are actually prominently used. Rockle score has eight parameters. Rockle score has a eight parameters. Not important to remember all of them. Let me tell you, we have systolic blood pressure. Yeah. Then we have blood urea nitrogen. Then we have hematocrit. Hematocrit. Then we have pulse. Then we have episode of melina. Yeah. Then we have. Then we have cardiac failure. Cardiac failure. And then we have liver failure. Liver failure. Are you getting? So pulse, melina, achha, one more thing is syncope. Syncope. So systolic BP, blood urea nitrogen, hematocrit, pulse, melina, syncope. They are all the parameters that we have. And 0 to 23 is the scoring system. But see, not at all very much important for you. When we talk about Rockel, actually Rockel is a very important score. It's a very, 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 very important score. 0 to 11 is the value and how I remember I always suggest this mnemonic to my students also remember it with case square case square what is case square C stands for comorbid illness comorbid illness then what is other thing A stands for age more than 60 less than 60 65 years then students S stands for presence or absence of shock then E stands uh, then E stands for endoscopic endoscopic diagnosis of GI bleed and the last E stands for endoscopic stigmata of GI bleed. So endoscopic stigmata, the endoscopic diagnosis means we went inside and we saw something. Yeah, that is active GI bleed. So we got the 
injury red handed so we went inside and we saw that there was an evidence of what gi bleed bachche but what is endoscopic stigmata of gi bleed can anyone tell me what is endoscopic stigmata like example is example is adherent clot so you went inside and you saw a clot bachche an adherent clot indicates an adherent clot indicates that yes there was a bleeding on the side and now it has been sealed with the help of a clot apart from this suppose if you get to see dule foys lesion dule foys lesion yeah or suppose if you get to see tears mallory v tears but see what does this mean dule foys lesion mallory v tears these tears signify that this was actually the site from where the bleeding might have occurred so that is what is endoscopic stigmata the bleeding is not there but yes but is spurting vessel tubocorane if you see spurting vessel will come under endoscopic diagnosis of gip then since we have peptic ulcer disease as a very common factor try to understand there is something which is known as the classical thing that i am talking about is have you heard of forest classification have you heard of forest classification what is this forest classification all about this is a classification for grading of peptic ulcer disease related bleeding so grading of peptic ulcer disease related bleeding and not only the peptic ulcer disease related bleeding is defined here what else is defined here tell me tell me along with this what else is defined along with this the risk of rebleed the risk of rebleeding so the risk of rebleeding is also significant here now let us see very good it's an endoscopic criteria so whenever you go for upper gi bleeding so this is on this is on upper gi endoscopy so whenever you have a patient of upper gi bleed due to peptic ulcer disease and you go inside you can have following grades so on one side we'll write the grade yeah on one side you write the remarks yeah and on the other side you will write the risk of rebleed the risk of rebleeding so whenever we have grade 1 one, one is further defined as 1a where you see active active pulsatile bleed what do you mean by active pulsatile bleed students this is very 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 important active pulsatile bleed it indicates that it's a what type of bleeding students this is not given in the word they may write the bleeding in spurts so something bleeding in spurt means an, an arterial source of bleeding and thus the risk of rebleed has to be what students very high the next is we have 1b what is 1b students it is nothing but active non pulsatile bleed so when we talk about active non pulsatile bleed what are the things that we should be notifying that if it is a non pulsatile bleed apart from this word the word ooze can be written so this is a venous venous source of excellent quane excellent so it's a venous source of bleeding but anyways beat arterial or beat venous the risk of bleed has to be high the next students that we talk about is two when we talk about two it's again a very 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 simple thing very simple thing we have 2a what do you mean by 2a students it's a non bleeding it's a non bleeding visible vessel what do you mean by non bleeding visible vessel can you tell me non bleeding visible vessel bachche this is the ulcer base so the ulcer mucosa has been destroyed and now you have a bleed we have a vessel which is visible bachche let me tell you one very important thing that the ulcer is not a you can say one day process ulcer has been generated because the protective barrier which was the mucosa has been demolished now since the mucosa is not there acid would be coming in contact with this vessel on and off on and off and you will not get to understand when this bleeding starts again so it's a bleeding vessel in no time the acid might erode into the lumen and yes hence the risk of bleeding shall be again written as high so when you talk about 2b students take my words 
this is the most frequent diagnosis that you get to understand that you get to see so 2b this is very 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 frequent and what is that students a 2b is adherent clot the most frequently asked questions adherent clot adherent clot what is that this is what adherent clot most frequently and when we talk about adherent clot the risk of rebreed is what students intermediate so we have intermediate are you getting intermediate yeah so clot has two you can say phase it can get absorbed also or it might get dislodged and bleed also so 2c what is 2c pigmented shallow ulcer what do you mean by pigmented shallow ulcer now the ulcer is on the track of what students healing so pigmented shallow ulcer the ulcer is on track of healing and therefore now you should consider the risk of bleeding as low when we talk about the 3 what is grade 3 students answer is is a clean ulcer when you talk about clean ulcer this is actually a healed ulcer and since it's a healed ulcer you would say the risk of rebleed is what low in this case so these are the classical scores which we are using in case of upper gi bleed and now i will actually discuss with you the causes of upper gi bleed so can i have from the audience what are the causes of upper gi bleed what are the two broad categories let us try to understand so when we talk about the upper gi bleed it is of two types one broad category that we need to understand because whenever we have a patient of upper gi bleed we try to rule out portal hypertension excellent either it is a variceal bleed very good variceal bleed or it is a non variceal bleed which is more frequent student variceal or a non variceal it is non variceal bleeds which are contributing to more than 80% of the cases and variceal bleeds are contributing to 20% so what are the variceal bleed in a broad term they are the bleed which is associated with portal hypertension so they are associated with portal hypertension and when we talk about portal hypertension what are the things that we have we have esophageal varices we have esophageal varices then students many a times you have isolated gastric varices isolated gastric varices do you know anything about isolated gastric varices they are often referred as igvs and igvs is a two is of two type so igv1 and igv2 what is igv1 and igv2 this is very 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 important for your exams when you talk about igv1 this is the varices the varices located at the fundus of the stomach remember this is gastric varix this is gastric varix located anywhere located anywhere other than the fundus so anywhere other than fundus and this is what is very 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 important so igv1 and igv2 remember one very important thing what do you get to see on upper gi endoscopy so on upper gi endoscopy you get to see cherry red spots so cherry red spots is what we get to see in case of isolated gastric varices so we have esophageal varices we have isolated gastric varices and the third one is portal hypertensive gastropathy what is portal hypertensive gastropathy this is again very 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 simple portal hypertensive gastropathy gastropathy this is to be understood portal hypertensive gastropathy is nothing but the very same thing that you get to see in gave so dilated mucosal vessels so dilated mucosal mucosal veins and this is seen at the level of proximal stomach normally gave is seen at the level of distal stomach what do you get to see on upper gi endoscopy you get to see a classical snake skin appearance so snake skin appearance is what we get one very important thing how do we see that this is a portal hypertensive gastropathy not a gave mucosal hyaline depositions are not seen and then they are responsive responsive to beta blocker so they respond to 
beta blocker whereas what will not respond kids tell me the gave will never respond so let us go to the other side let us talk about the non variceal causes of the upper gi bleed so i hope this is clear the variceal section when we talk about the non variceal causes which are more frequent the first to be understood here what is that answer is this is peptic ulcer disease pud pud that is peptic ulcer disease the second is mallory v steer so this is in order the second is mallory v steer when we talk about mallory v steer what is to be understood and remembered mallory v steer is nothing but the tear involving the mucosa as well as the submucosa and where along the cardia and within 2 cm of the g junction so cardia is very 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 important and actually what is the classical thing that you get to see in peptic ulcer disease you get to see you get to see massive upper gi bleed so massive hematemesis massive hematemesis is what we get to see in peptic ulcer disease same we get to see something in mallory v steers but in mallory v steers there is often an inciting factor like let me tell you about peptic ulcer disease there could be a incident that there is massive sudden hematemesis in mallory v steer it looks like same but it is not same this is sudden sudden forceful sudden forceful vomiting and after sudden forceful vomiting you have hematemesis so remember there are certain clues which will help you understand the thing you often get a question a young corporate male went for a launch party of a product and there he had bouts of alcohol and presented with massive hematemesis and you think that after alcohol if there is be it should be mallory v's wrong bachche corporate lifestyle hari kari worry this could be an indication for pre existing peptic ulcer disease but the very same question young corporate male went for after launch party of a product had a sudden forceful vomiting and then hematemesis now the diagnosis will change to students mallory v steer so it's very important to understand what is asked in question vomiting followed by hematemesis it's a mallory v because there's a component which has incited a gas certain gastric distension resulting in damage to mucosa sub mucosa and peptic ulcer disease essentially this is not at all important the next apart from this what are the other causes what are the other causes uh, for gi bleed the third is we have gastritis and when you talk about gastritis there are a lot of things to be remembered in gastritis i'll not take this thing too much so remember we have a classical what classification we have a sydney classification and according to the sydney classification we have type a gastritis and what is type a gastritis remember six a's are there it is autoimmune it is autoimmune then it is associated with what tell me uh, atrophy it is associated with the atrophy of the parietal cells not only this it is associated with enteral hyperplasia so enteral sparing is there the enteral is spared and g cell hyperplasia why because acid is going down and body is asking the gastric uh, enteral cells what are you doing please generate some acid for me but this is no where helping out so enteral g cell hyperplasia is there since it is autoimmune there has to be anemia and what type of anemia first there will be pernicious anemia and then pernicious anemia and then you will have megaloblastic megaloblastic anemia what else is important in type a gastritis this is the variety which is also associated with what adeno ca are you getting so autoimmune at a and uh, auto antibodies to parietal cell this is what then we have a type b type b type of gastritis what is that this is associated classically with intestinal intestinal metaplasia point number 1 the second thing that we have to understand kids that this is the variety which is associated with h pylori apart from this what are the others we have reflux gastritis which is associated with biliary reflux and this is seen generally post gastro jejunostomy biliary m reflux are you getting this then what are the other type of gastritis we have erosive gastritis when we talk about erosive gastritis this is associated with either ncs or associated with alcohol then what are the other types of we have 
lymphocytic gastritis when you talk about lymphocytic gastritis this is again associated with the lymphocytic so they are lymphocytic infiltration so t and b lymphocytic infiltration will result in a maltoma or you can also say that this is associated with h pylori infection apart from this what else is important stress gastritis now what is the concept of stress gastritis students it's very easy during stress or trauma or burn anything the blood is diverted so what happens in stress the blood is diverted towards the important organs so when the blood is diverted out of git out from git there will be a classical state of blood deprivation and therefore there is ischemia when you talk about the stomach when you talk about the stomach acha this ischemia will recur, will cause mucosal atrophy why because bachche mucosa is the most precarious and this is going to result in ulcers or which is known as stress ulcer if you talk about the git what is the most heavily perfused you have to understand this is the place where you have the celiac trunk and therefore if you talk about the fundus fundus is a gray zone so fundus or you can say the proximal stomach is least perfused is least perfused therefore therefore it is prone to develop what prone to ischemia are you getting and that is what is actually the concept of stress gastritis so what are the stress ulcers it is associated with nothing but during stress there is diversion of blood flow from the gi tract away to the vital organs are you getting now this is what is in case of burns in case of burn this is also known as what ulcers curling ulcers they are known as curling ulcer now let me tell you in case of head injury in case of head injury there is dual mechanism of head dual mechanism of stress gastritis so what is the dual mechanism of stress gastritis let me tell you one very important thing what is that one is the stress one is the stress induced one is the stress induced ulcer at proximal stomach i hope one this mechanism is clear but when we talk about a specific mechanism of head injury what is that whenever there is head injury what whenever there is head injury the second mechanism so this is one mechanism the second is try to understand the head injury causes a sudden stimulation of vagal high, vagal nucleus so there is sudden stimulation of vagal nucleus why because there is head injury and there is sudden stimulation of vagal nucleus and because which is located at the floor of what ventricle there is located at the floor of fourth ventricle so when there is stimulation of the vagal nucleus located at the floor of the fourth ventricle there will be stimulation of the vagus and if there is stimulation of the vagus you have to understand that vagus is secreto motor you know left anterior larp left anterior right posterior so this is actually a stimulus so there is stimulation of parietal cells and if there is stimulation of the parietal cells there will be what hyperchlorhydria so there are two things which are happening on one side on one side there is a ischemia related ulcer on the another side because of the acute head injury there is hyperchlorhydria now try to understand when you talk about hyperchlorhydria the acid according to the gastric motility the acid shall be accumulating in what area this is the place where lot of acid will be accumulating so acid will be accumulated at the level of antrum and slowly and slowly this acid will also be going to the what students to the duodenum now use your common sense that the gastric mucosa is resistant to the acid therefore it tolerates the acid for a longer time now the moment you eat anything the moment you drink anything the pylorus is relaxed and lot of acid enters into the duodenum but intestinal mucosa is not designed and therefore hyperchlorhydria induces it induces what students ulcers at the level of the first part of the duodenum greater than antrum and the pylorus are you getting and these are known as cushing ulcers so let me tell you when we talk about stress gastritis there are two kinds of ulcers that we expect one is the cushing ulcer that is seen because of the hyperchlorhydria and the another one is the stress induced ulcers at the level of proximal stomach 
so don't behave like morons there are a lot of people who don't know the difference between this and they keep on mugging up but say stress ulcer has a different mechanism but when you talk typically of curlings and cushings let me tell you the cushing word refers to the typical head injury head insult which causes hyper stimulation of the vagus and thus it results in the ulcers there are apart from this a lot other things that you need to understand but let us see what are the others after this what are the other causes other non vericial causes now when we talk about other non vericial causes i hope students this concept of gi bleed and the stress ulcer is it clear to everyone or no is it clear to everyone yeah let us let us see let us see more important things yeah is it clear are you getting others yes excellent we have dule foys lesion so let me dule foys lesion when we talk about dule foys lesion students you have to understand they are congenital congenital dilated dilated artery dilated artery at the level of submucosa so congenital lesion we get to see a dilated artery at the level of submucosa antrum is spared antrum is spared and cardia is what is the most common sign so cardia is the most common sign but so what do we get to see on upper gi endoscopy usually on an academy i take this lecture or even in my offline centers i take this lecture for at least 4 hours 4 hours i teach the upper gi bleeds and the lower gi bleeds because it's a huge chapter i'm just trying to have an overview and i'm just trying to play with you so when we talk about upper gi bleeds in this case of dule foys you get to see reddish brown reddish brown nipple reddish brown nodule or a nipple or 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 when you go for upper gi bleed you see a classically so this is the vessel and over this you have the mucosa submucosa so you classically see a caliber persistent snake like dilated vein suppose can you see the vein in my arm can you see a vein in my arm so can you see my vein in my hand so you can see a dilated vein similarly in the stomach also you get to see a similar dilated thick vein so if you see the veins of the hand they are dilated and sometimes they are more superficial in people who do a lot of exercise so remember you get to see caliber persistent vessel so caliber persistent vessel is what is the term that we designate to it then what else is present students we have the very simple thing that is what is known as gave what is gave kids what is gave gave is known by the name of gastric antral vascular ectasia so gastric antral vascular ectasia this is nothing but it involves the antrum so antrum is involved and what is spared in this case cardia is spared the second very important thing that you get to see on upper gi endoscopy we get to see the typical watermelon stomach so watermelon stomach why it is known as watermelon if you cut open a slice of watermelon can you see that fibrous uh, you can say fibrous red section so if this is a watermelon and this is the outer shell if you see the watermelon have you seen a typical watermelon this is how a watermelon is so this is how it appears watermelon stomach and what is it students dekho gave is different it's a dilated mucosal veins and capillaries whereas what was dilated dilated arteries at the level of submucosa so dilated mucosal veins and capillaries this is what is known as gave so are you getting so this is what is gave and we have dule foys lesion what else is important kids what else the third acha along with this we have mucosal hyalinization mucosal hyalinization apart from this you can have the bleed in case of uh, you, you can say autoentric fistula autoentric fistula what else is there you can have it in case of hemobilia so we can get to see hemobilia what else could be the reason the fifth is we can have hemosuccus pancreaticus 
so what is hemosuccus pancreaticus it is nothing but upper gi bleed post acute pancreatitis it is nothing but the pancreatic pseudocyst rupturing into the uh, you can say into the nearby vessel so the blood from that vessel enters into the pseudocyst via pseudocyst since it is connected with the main pancreatic duct it will come down and the blood starts to trickle out from the second part of duodenum since it is proximal to the ligament of free it will be considered as upper GI bleed students I wanted to understand a lot of things I, uh, I wanted to explain you a lot of things but due to limited time I couldn't so remember do subscribe to me on an academy so that you don't miss any notification of my classes and you can use the code surgery live to join an academy or you can also use the code dr dixit to enroll yourself and get some extra discount for an academy so i hope you enjoy this enjoyed this lecture and at an academy we'll be getting lot more interesting content for you so till then bye 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 bye